Club of Reem. This is James Trim, and as you know, my uh, uh, purpose in life is the restoration of the ancient sect of Nazarene Judaism, the original Jewish followers of Yeshua as the Messiah. Um, and uh, we are experiencing this great last day's restoration uh, right now, in these very days. And um, in talking with people about Yeshua as the Messiah from a Jewish background, one of the uh, um, adversaries that we have are the uh, so-called counter-missionaries or anti-missionaries, like to be a singer of uh, 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 Jews for Judaism and so on. Uh, and so today I wanted to address the Torah principle of unequal weights and measures and um, demonstrate how consistently the counter-missionaries uh, in their attacks violate this basic Torah principle. Uh, before I go uh, further, I need to ask you to please consider supporting this great work. Um, this is my uh, uh, primary purpose of life and, and what I do and uh, putting out these videos and uh, the online commentaries and the online blogs and the uh, 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 online halakha material, etc. All of this material, the defense of Yeshua as the Messiah, is um, uh, takes time. And uh, the reality is that time is money uh, because uh, I also have to have a place to live, food to eat, uh, electricity, uh, an internet service to share this material with you, and so on. And ultimately, that takes money. Um, so I'm asking you all to please consider uh, supporting this work with your tithes, free will offerings, gifts. And uh, you can send those to donations at wnae.org. That's donations at wnae.org. Or click on the uh, link in the description of the video uh, where you can find out uh, where you can donate. Uh, and so uh, please consider very strongly, consider doing that. Uh, donations have been very low over the last five weeks through December and into January. And um, one of our major donors has uh, uh, had to uh, step back in making donations uh, financially. So we really need uh, more of you to step up and uh, help us. We barely, barely paid the rent this last month. Um, we really need some people, more people, and we need you to to be there for us, to, uh, to uh, get this work done. Okay, um, that's enough of that. I'm gonna move on to uh, unequal weights and measures. Uh, this is a Torah principle, uh, by the way, as always, well, almost always, we have handouts for this study in uh, the form of a PDF that you can either uh, look at on your screen or print out and have the handouts uh, to go through at home. Um, so this is very much like, uh, you know, teaching in a class. Um, so the, uh, the the handouts are in a link, at a link that you can find in the description of this video if you're looking actually right there on YouTube. And um, uh, if not, if you're looking on, at Nazarene Space slash blog, uh, you'll find them at the link directly below me. All right. Uh, the first item in our handouts is titled Unequal Weights and Measures, and uh, it gives us the two passages from the Torah that give the mitzvah uh, of unequal weights and measures. Um, the first is in Leviticus 19, 35 through 36, where we read, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment in mit 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 mityard in weight or in measure. Just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hin shall you have. I am Yahweh your Elohim who bought, brought you 
out of the land of Egypt. And then Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 16, says, You shall not have in your bag diverse weights, a great and a small. You shall not have in your house diverse measures, a great and a small. A perfect and just weight shall you have. A perfect and just measure shall you have, that your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. Uh, for all this, uh, for all that you do such things, even that do unrighteously, are an abomination unto Yahweh your Elohim. So what this is talking about in the Peshat is that uh, a merchant would, a dishonest merchant, would often have two sets of weights in his bag, one set that he would pull out when he was buying, say, uh, grain, and another set that he would pull out when he was selling grain, so that uh, one set of weights was a little bit heavier than the other. Uh, and so um, uh, the, the purpose of this was to pocket the difference and take advantage of people. And um, uh, it, it, it was, it's a form of, of outright dishonesty. And it's, it's a timeless thing even today. For example, here in Texas where I live, we have the Bureau of Weights and Measures that goes around and makes sure, for example, that when you get gas from the gas uh, uh, at, the, at the gas station, that it's measuring gallons properly and not uh, shorting you on gallons. And there's, there's a, a seal where they've uh, inspected it uh, at intervals to, by the, the states inspected it to make sure that they're using um, uh, proper weights and measures, okay? Uh, equal weights and measures. Uh, so this is, a, this is a timeless thing in the literal. But it's also a principle um, and it's the basic principle by which we actually get, and you can see this in, in uh, Mat Matthew or Matityahu, uh, chapter 7. It's actually the principle by which we get the idea of treating, in Leviticus 19.18, of treating uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Equal weights and balances, justice, if you will. And it's the idea then of... Um, uh, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, equal weights and balances. But it's also the idea that we're going to talk about here then that from this general principle of judging your criteria by the same way as somebody else's or judging somebody else's criteria the same way that you would judge your own. And uh, consistently, we see that the anti-missionaries don't do this, that they are like, we have an expression in, in English and in American culture, uh, in English speaking culture, probably, about throwing rocks in being, living in a glass house and throwing rocks. Um, a person who lives in a glass house, is, you know, we also have a similar expression about the pot calling the kettle black. Um, so... This is uh, uh, the general principle that we want to apply and see how the uh, counter-missionaries measure up. So the first, uh, the next handout is titled Alleged Historical Inaccuracies in the Ketuvim Netzarim. In the uh, Ketuvim Netzarim, for those that don't know, is the correct title, if you will, for the books known as the New Testament, because they are neither a New Testament uh, or the New Covenant described in Jeremiah 31. That's not really what they are. Um, and they, uh, um, uh, they are therefore not the Brit Chadashah, which is the same thing, because um, uh, one cannot actually make a good case that the books of the so-called New Testament are synonymous with the Brit Chadashah that Jeremiah speaks of in Jeremiah 31. Uh, the uh, so-called church fathers uh, created that nomenclature so that they could, uh, and then called the Tanakh the Old Testament, uh, so that they could uh, uh, give the impression that uh, the Old Testament is obsolete and 
the New Testament replaces effectively replaces it. Okay, but enough of that. Let's uh, look at our next handout: alleged historical inaccuracies in the Ketuvim Mitzrayim. And the first one we'll look at, you probably may have heard, uh, the anti-missionaries say, "Hey, Nazareth didn't exist in the first century." So the the uh, uh, the account that we see in the Gospels is false because Yeshua couldn't have been raised in Nazareth, and uh, because it wasn't there. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the uh, the claim that Nazareth doesn't exist is uh, based on the false logic that absence of evidence is evidence of absence. And of course, uh, the law, the actual logic axiom of logic is that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So their argument is based on the fact that Nazareth isn't mentioned in any Jewish literature prior to the third century CE. But that's a little misleading, too, because it's mentioned in the New Testament, which is uh, uh, prior to the 3rd century CE. And it's also uh, um, mentioned by church fathers uh, that uh, refer to the issue um, during that time. Um, Jerome quotes from the Gospel according to the Hebrews is referring to it. Uh, but evidence of absence is not absence of evidence. And in fact, in 1962, a Hebrew inscription was found on a marble fragment from a synagogue found in, in uh, Caesarea uh, Maritima, which mentioned Nazareth in the assignment of priests that took place uh, at some time after the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was between 132 and 135 C, uh, CE. Uh, so there's very few scholars, serious academics today, that doubt that Nazareth actually existed as early as the first century. That's what happens with this whole false thinking of evidence of uh, that absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Um, oftentimes we make discoveries where we learn things that we simply never knew before and change our entire view of what something historically was. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, the opening passages, well, close to the opening passages of Luke, stating the circumstances of the time in which Yeshua uh, was born, and which uh, um, uh, Yochanan was born, and, and all these events started to take place. And uh, this, this, uh, says, and it happened in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the land should be enrolled. This enrollment first happened during the governorship of Quirinius of Syria. Um, Anti-missionaries will say this is filled with inaccuracies and that uh, the census of Quirinius was, he was governor of Syria at the time, and that people uh, did not have to return to their ancestral homes, as Luke says, that this is all inaccurate. So let's look at this. First of all, um, and this is one of the reasons that the Scripture Restoration Project is so important, is that uh, if we go back and we look at the uh, Aramaic and the Old Syriac version of this passage, we see that the word for, where it says all the land, the Old Syriac and Aramaic has Kale era. Era is the Aramaic equivalent of Eretz in Hebrew. Uh, Aramaic and Hebrew are very closely related languages. Uh, this word, uh, Eretz, uh, Strong 776, uh, is a word that can mean world, as in Proverbs 19.4, earth, as in Daniel 2.35, or land, as in Daniel 9.15, and it's often used as a euphemism for the land of Israel, as in Daniel 9, 6. Um, in fact, in Israel today, it's the, often referred to by Israelis as Hiretz, the land. Um, the Greek translator mistook the word to mean world, and thus translated world, giving the uh, 
mistaken impression that Luke was speaking of one of the three empire-wide censuses that took place in 28 BC, uh, 28 BCE, 8 BCE, and 14 CE. None of these dates fit well with the time of the birth of the Messiah. And so the entire missionaries say, see, see, but uh, we look at the Aramaic text that Luke uh, actually refers to a much smaller local census um, and not to the one of the three empire-wide censuses at all. Uh, this is uh, supported by the fact that Luke uses the phrase, this enrollment first happened. So as to contrast this enrollment uh, uh, by another that was ordered by Quirinius in 6 CE, which Luke mentions in his second book in Acts, chapter 5, verse 37. Acts is really second Luke, if you will. Okay, uh, that census was a local census of Judah, and so it stands uh, to reason that this census was also a local census of Judah, or Haaretz, the land, and um, not one of the uh, uh, three uh, empire-wide censuses that uh, uh, took, took place throughout the entire Roman Empire. Um, Luke says this happened during the governorship of Quirinius in Syria, or at least in the canonical you know, Greek text. Uh, this is the, also the reading of the Peshitta Aramaic. Um, but the old Syriac Aramaic says, in the days of, in the, in the years of Quirinius, governor of Syria. Not while he was necessarily, while he was governor. His full name was uh, Publius uh, Sulpicius Quirinius, and I'm probably butchering the Latin name here. Uh, skeptics have made much of the fact that Quirinius is known to have become governor of Syria not until 6 CE, that's several years too late to fit the time of Yeshua's birth. However, there's two workable solutions to this apparent problem. The first is that Quirinius may have served as governor of Syria once before. Uh, perhaps as a military governor, uh, prior to his installation in 6 CE. There's a Latin inscription that's been found recording the career of a dis uh, dis distinguished woman officer who, when he became imperial legate of Syria, entered upon that office, quote, for the second time. Um, the Latin is Eterum. Uh, this Roman officer very well could have been Quirinius. So it's very possible that Quirinius served as governor of Syria on two separate occasions. Now, the second answer to this is that the years of Quirinius actually begin before he was actually became governor of Syria, following the reading of the old Syriac, uh, Aramaic. And Quirinius was governing in Syria as a Roman senator in charge of being the assessor of property in Syria, as well as Judea, which the Romans regarded as part of Syria. Under the Roman reckoning, Judea was actually part of Syria. Uh, his name was also mentioned in Res Geste, the deeds of Augustus by Augustus, which was found in the city of Antioch, uh, uh, Pis Pisidia, placing him in uh, as council as early as 12 BCE. The Greek geographer and historian Strabo, uh, who was around 63 BCE to 12, 23 AD or CE, seems to indicate that Quirinius may have been in Syria with a special commission for military operations between 10 and 7 BCE. Moreover, Roman historian Tacitus mentions that Quirinius was appointed by Augustus to be an advisor to his young son Caius Caesar um, in Ar Armenia. Caius was sent to administer Syria in 1 CE with Quirinius as his advisor, 
So there's a good evidence that, quote, the years of Quirinius in Syria began several years before he was installed as governor in 6 CE. There are also alleged historical inaccuracies in the Tanakh. For example, Daniel chapter 4 records that Nebuchadnezzar spent seven years insane, living like an animal. However, there's no record of this in any secular historical source. Um, and due to this absence of evidence, many skeptics regard this as historically inaccurate. Uh, also, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 5, verses 30 through 31, the very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain, uh, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Yet, secular historians say that Belshazzar was not the king of Babylon at the time, and that uh, Nabonidus was the king of Babylon at the demise of the Chaldean Empire. Belshazzar was his son. Also, there's no reference to Darius the Mede in any ancient document. In fact, the secular historians claim that Darius never took the kingdom, nor was he ever king of Babylon. Again, absence of evidence, however, is not really evidence of absence. Um, 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 19. We read, Pul, the king of Assyria, came against the land. Yet, secular sources say that there's no person named Pul who was known to become king of Assyria, and the king who secular historians believe reigned in Assyria at the time was Eva Bish. In fact, skeptics have argued that there was no historical evidence that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or even Moses ever even existed, much less Adam, Enoch, or Noah. They argue that there's no historical evidence that there was ever a slaughter of the innocents at the time of Moses' birth, or that the Hebrews were ever slaves in Egypt, or that the Exodus ever even occurred. In fact, whereas Genesis chapter 12 and 24 claimed that Abraham owned camels, archaeologists uh, claim that the camels were not domesticated in the land of Canaan until the 10th century BCE, and that's about a thousand years after the time of Abraham. So we see that the uh, counter missionaries are not applying equal weights and measures. They're not judging uh, the Ketuvim Netzarim by the same standard as the Tanakh, or they're not judging the Tanakh by the same standard as the Ketuvim Netzarim. Both have alleged historical inaccuracies, largely due to uh, uh, absence of evidence, which is not evidence of absence. Okay. Our next handout is apparent contradictions in the Ketuvim Netzarim. Uh, so this is another thing that the counter missionaries will key in on, that there's an, apparently a contradiction between this passage and that passage. Uh, one of Good example is Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days, Yeshua took Kepha and Yaakov and Yochanan, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain apart. And this is also similar to Mark chapter 9, verse 2, six days again. But Luke chapter 9, verse 28, in the parallel passage, says, and it happened that about eight days after these words, Yeshua took Kepha and Yaakov and Yochanan and ascended a mountain to pray. Now, this apparent contradiction is easily resolved. Um, the difference is between inclusive and exclusive counting. For example, right now, um, we have in Texas an election on March 1st. And if I wanted to count the, the days from now to the election, there are two ways I could do that. I could count the intervening days without counting today and without counting March 1st, the day of the election itself. I could count those days and I would be exact, completely right to say there are X number of days between now and the election or from, from now to the election. 
I could also count today and the day of the election, which would inflate that number by two, and that would also be a correct way or a correct statement, because then that would be uh, inclusive counting as opposed to exclusive counting. Okay, so the difference here is that in Matthew and Mark, only the intervening days are being counted, and in Luke, the day of and the day being counted to is included in the count. It's that simple. Uh, next page gives us another example. Favorite the anti missionaries uh, like to point to is the contradiction between Mark 15 25. Mark 15 25 says, And it was the third hour when they crucified him. But John 19 14 says, And it was the day of preparation for Pesach, and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Judeans, Behold your king. Mark 15, 25 says it was the third hour, and John 19, 14 says it was the sixth hour. Well, the problem here is that the word hour, our idea of an hour, didn't exist in the first century. It didn't exist because the clock had not yet, as we know it, had not yet been invented. Okay, they didn't have this thing on the wall ticking away, okay? And... Um, the only way they had to measure the, the length of a day were certain points, basic points. Um, sunset, sunrise, and high noon. And sundials were in use, and uh, there were, they could measure the uh, passing and the time of day pretty well. But at night, they were useless. And so everything was a little bit more ambiguous than it is now. In fact, there's a, a whole discussion in the Talmud in Tractate Barakot um, about the different methods um, uh, of uh, the different rabbis used uh, for how many watches there were in a night, how many hours there were, and so on, because there wasn't a universal accepted system. And so there were debates about this, even in the Talmudic literature. Um, and by the way, the counter missionaries should be well aware of that. Um, so Mark is using a system by which the whole 24 hour day, uh, by, by modern reckoning, in other words, daytime and nighttime, um, was divided into just 12 hours, uh, quote-unquote hours. Um, and English didn't exist yet, but so the, the word hours wasn't really used, but we'll say hours, which were about twice as long as our modern hours, such that daytime only had six hours, and therefore, if you had a sundial, high noon, when the sun was directly above in the sky, halfway between sunrise and sunset, was the third hour. So the third hour was high noon. And then we get to uh, the reckoning that's used in John, uh, which agrees with uh, that which was used uh, in, um, we've actually found some Roman sundials using this system, which was the official Roman system. And it had a 12 hour day, like we do. I say like we do, but remember the days and nights are of different lengths as the year progresses and the day gets longer and then shorter again. And so um, if you divide the day into 12 equal portions, you still don't have exactly what we call an hour, but you're starting to get close. Uh, but this divided a day into 12 equal portions, and high noon then was at six on the sundial, the sixth hour. And so uh, both passages are saying that it was high noon, 
They're simply using two different systems of reckoning that were in use at the time. Now let's talk about apparent contradictions in the Tanakh. Um, a famous one is in 2 Samuel 24.1 and 1 Chronicles 21.1. Uh, 2 Samuel 24, 1 says, And again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So here, um, David is, is moved by Elohim to uh, uh, have a census of Israel. And then in uh, um, 1 Chronicles 21, 1, it says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So which is it? There's an apparent contradiction here. And by the way, Muslims love to point to this contradiction and say there's a contradiction in the Tanakh. In fact, it can be explained. Uh, there is an idiom in Hebrew by which the active verb is used to... Um, uh, indicate that Elohim does something that in reality he in his sovereignty allows to happen. And so 2 Samuel 24 1 is really telling us that Elohim allowed uh, David to be moved uh, to take a census of Israel. And 1 Chronicles 21 1 is telling us that Satan did it. Have being allowed to by Elohim's sovereignty. So they are com completely compatible if one understands this idiom of the Hebrew language. Um, there are many other examples of this idiom, but we're not going to go there right now. Um, another example is uh, uh, Yehoahim, was eight according to 2 Kings 24 8 was 18 years old when he became king but when we look in 2 Chronicles 36 9 we see he was eight years old now uh, this case is a contradiction is probably a scribal error there's a scribal error in the Mesoretic text in some manuscripts of the Septuagint but some Hebrew manuscripts uh, the Peshitta Aramaic Tanakh and the Alexandrian text of the Septuagint have 18 in both passages. Um, this opens to the door to another video I will do in the near future about how the counter missionaries misrepresent the Mesoretic text, the Septuagint, the Peshitta, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, their value as witnesses to the text of the Tanakh. But that's another video. Um, uh, so another example is in 2 Kings 24, 8, which says that Ye Jehoiakim reigned for three months, and um, 2 Chronicles 36, 9 says it was three months and ten days. Um, in 2 Samuel 24, 9, the census count of Israel was 800,000 and Judah 500,000. But in second in 1 Chronicles 21, 5, uh, the parallel passage says that there was 1,100,000 of Israel and four, uh, 470,000 of Judah. Um, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 15 tells us that the two pillars in the temple were 18 cubits high. But 2 Chronicles th uh, 3, 15 tells us they were 35 cubits high. Interesting. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 28 says there were 420 talents of gold brought back from Ophir. The parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 8, 18 says that there were 450. Um, I could go on, but the point is not really to tear down the Tanakh. That is not really what my desire is to do. I believe in the talk, Tanakh and the inspiration of the Tanakh, and I believe these all can be explained uh, by looking at the various uh, uh, possible scribal errors 
and the various witnesses to the text of the Tanakh in addition to just the Masoretic text. Also, the seven rules of Hillel, uh, which are basic rules of Jewish hermeneutics, the sixth of the seven rules of Hillel is, uh, tells us that, um, or basically that if we have two passages that seem to contradict one another, that a third passage may resolve the conflict. Uh, some examples in the Tanakh, Leviticus 1.1 says, out of the tent of meeting, and Exodus 25.22 says, from above the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim. They seem to disagree. But when we look at Numbers 7.89, we learn that Moshe entered, in, uh, entered the tent of meeting to hear Yahweh speak from between the cherubim. So it resolves the apparent conflict. First Chronicles 27.1 explained the numerical disagreement between Second Chronicle, uh, Second Samuel 25.9, 24.9, and First Chronicles 21.5. Exodus chapter 19 verse 20, Yahweh came down upon the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, seems to disagree with Deuteronomy 4.36, out of heaven uh, he let you hear his voice. Um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, uh, verse 22 in some editions, reconciles the two by telling us that Elohim brought the heavens down to the mount and then spoke, uh, as we find in the in Sifra 1 7. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this rule that we're talking about, the sixth rule of Hillel, similar to what the reformers called the analogia scriptura, the analogy of scripture which tells us that if we understand two passages in such a way as to contradict one another, we're misunderstanding one or both of them. Uh, the important thing here is that the sixth rule of Hillel tells us that passages of the Tanakh may appear to contradict one another. And so we shouldn't be surprised when uh, passages of the Ketuvim Netzarim appear to contradict one another. And uh, so we learn yet again that the counter missionaries are not applying the same uh, scrutiny of applying the same um, uh, criteria in judging the Ketuvim Netzarim and judging the Tanakh. Okay, our next handout, apparent con chronological conflicts in the Ketuvim Netzarim. I'm not going to attempt to list them. Um, we all know that there's chronological difficulties between, particularly when you compare Matthew to Mark and Luke. Um, uh, they place events chronologically in a different order. And uh, this is why creating gospel harmonies is um, a task, trying to figure out uh, the correct chronological uh, passing of events. And um, part of that is because we assume that chronology was as important to the ancients as it is to us. Um, there are apparent chronological conflicts in the Tanakh, and we don't even have to go any further than the first two chapters to find one. If we compare, I'm not going to read them through them, I have them here in the handout, but if we compare the um, creation account in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 through 27, with the creation account in Genesis chapter 2, we, we find a conflict that in Genesis chapter 1, it appears uh, that plants and animals were created before man. But in Genesis chapter 2, it appears to have plants and animals created after man. And so there's an apparent chronological conflict. Uh, again, the anti-missionaries do not apply the same weights and measures to both the Ketuvim Netzarim and the Tanakh. Uh, alleged pagan influences is our final uh, topic here in our next handout. Anti-missionaries will argue that there are pagan influences in the so-called New Testament. For example, they'll accuse the concept of the virgin birth and the resurrection and the deity of Messiah to be pagan influences on the so-called New Testament. <laughs> and 
all this really is is evidence that Hasatan is a counterfeiter. Okay. Um, our next handout then is alleged pagan influences uh, on the Tanakh. Uh, there's an example of uh, uh, here of unequal weights and measures. For example, uh, regarding the creation account in the Torah, it's claimed that there are similarities between the Babylonian and Old Testament accounts. A tabulation is given by Kindel in the Babylonian Genesis, uh, he, uh, illustrating this. In the Old Testament, a beginning survey by Dane R. Gordon, 1985, page 20, referencing the Babylonian Genesis, second edition, 1951, page 129. This book, which was actually uh, my college textbook uh, on Old Testament survey. Very liberal book, by the way. Uh, don't like it. Uh, and uh, boy, 1985 was a long time ago, but I still have it. Um, scholars also see many parallels between the Babylonian flood story and that of Noah as found in the Torah. Uh, the name of the Babylonian Noah was Utapishtim. Like Noah, uh, this is a quote from the same book. The name of the Babylonian Noah was Utapishtim. Like Noah, he was warned by a god, Ea, the benevolent god of the earth, to build a ship and to take on board the seed of all living things. The vessel was loaded and there followed a wild storm, which blew for six days and nights. When it subsided, Uptashim opened a hatch and looked out upon the water. All mankind uh, had returned to clay. He sat down and wept. Uh, by the level of the water fell, and the ship grounded. Uptashim then left the ship and offered sacrifice. Um, so, there again, a, pagan, a parallel with paganism. Uh, there's also parallels between the Torah and the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi. For example, the Torah has, uh, in Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 through 25, uh, but if any harm follow, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Uh, in Leviticus 24, 19, if a man maim his neighbor he, uh, as he has done, he shall, uh, so shall it be done to him. Now, uh, I've done uh, um, commentary on this, and the Jewish understanding of this found in the Talmud uh, is that it's actually not a law of revenge. It's a law uh, that deals in, Ju in uh, Jewish understanding with um, the uh, 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 legal liability. Uh, however, we read in the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, if a man has destroyed the eye of a man of the gentleman class, they shall destroy his eye. If he has destroyed the eye of a commoner, he shall pay one mina of silver. If he has destroyed the eye of a gentleman's slave, he shall pay half the slave's price. Um, Scholars have also seen strong parallels between many of the psalms uh, in the Tanakh and Egyptian psalm, psalms to other deities that predate them. For example, Psalm 104 is said to have a remarkable resemblance to the hymn of Aten, uh, according to Pritchard B. in the Ancient Near East, an anthology of texts and pictures, Princeton University Press. 1958, page 227. Another alleged pagan influence on the Tanakh uh, can be found in the names of the two protagonists of the Book of Esther, which are named Esther and Mordecai. And that's a very strong parallel to the Babylonian god Marduk and his consort, the goddess Ishtar. Okay. So once again, we find that the counter-missionaries are not judging the Ketuvim Netzarim by the same criteria that 
they should be judging the Tanakh. Um, and in each of these uh, instances, the in each of these attacks on the Ketuvim Netzarim, we see that the anti missionaries are uh, throwing stones but living in glass houses because the same things that they're saying about the Ketuvim Netzarim could also be said about the Tanakh. Um, in both cases, I believe that the attacks, um, the, the uh, problems that are pointed out can be resolved. But the point is that they both do have the alleged problems. And so uh, to uh, uh, point at the Ketuvim Netzarim and say it's got these alleged problems when you know or should know that the Tanakh has the same alleged problems is simply violating the principle of unequal weights and measures. And so uh, uh, I hope this is uh, maybe uh, 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 helped you in your faith and your understanding of the Ketuvim Netzarim and its value and uh, 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 helped you to give an answer for your faith, as uh, the scriptures say, and to uh, be ready to respond uh, with a, with a answer when a, uh, these kinds of attacks are made and demonstrate that they are unjustified attacks, that the Ketuvim Netzarim stands up to the same kind of scrutiny that the Tanakh stands up to. And um, uh, while one can point to these alleged problems in the Ketuvim Netzarim, one could also point to these same alleged problems in the Tanakh. And yet the Tanakh is inspired and true, as is the Ketuvim Netzeri. All right, uh, please consider once again uh, supporting this work with your tithes and offerings. And you can uh, um, uh, do that by donating, by clicking on the donate button, oh, not the donate button, but the, uh, the link to donate in the description of the video. Um, so please donate, donate, donate. Um, and uh, uh, until next time, uh, let's uh, uh, just bid you farewell and uh, 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 we'll be working on some other videos very soon. Uh, I've got a plan, a plan for a video to discuss how the uh, uh, Sources for the Tanakh are misrepresented by the counter missionaries and um, uh, many other videos as well. So keep watching this channel, like the video, and um, share the video, like the video, and tell us what you think in the comments section. Shalom.